So what I'm doing now is trying to see what the output is for the stepper motor when you basically just have an open circuit uh, measurement connected to the to it. I believe this is um, a bipolar stepper motor, meaning that it has two separate windings, at least connected to the outputs. Um, you see two separate windings. And when you increment it four times, this seems to be the cycle that it um, outputs. So you have um, channel one with a larger spike negative, smaller spike, larger spike positive, and then a smaller spike positive. Whereas channel two, you sort of have that same thing, but shifted over one notch. So they're out of phase in that sense. And this should give a quadrature output for an encoder. The question is, how do you interpret that? Um, it's easy enough to interpret if you've just got set thresholds that you are looking for to reach, you would just use, you know, a comparator or a set of comparators. The problem comes when the motor spins faster, the output magnitude is proportional or related to, I, I don't know if it's directly proportional, but it is related to how fast you spin the motor. So you can see a slow spin, kind of consistent, okay. Give the scope a minute. Slow spin is sort of consistent output. Faster spin, those output magnitudes change. And if you go really fast, it's just a cluster of spikes. So what I want to see is if you can still see what's going on even as you go faster. So it looks a lot more sinusoidal now, which this is interesting how you almost get ringing of the output at lower speeds and that ringing kind of isn't as visible or it disappears entirely at higher speeds. So I guess what I want to see is when you go fast to a stop, yeah, this is what it looks like. And as we zoom in, you can see how these are still pretty much out of phase. It's still, I think, useful what you're getting out of this because you have, let's see if I can get a pointer. Um, you have your positive spike on channel one, and then, you know, out of phase with that. I guess you would say 90 degrees out of phase, I think. Um, out of 90 degrees out of phase would be the positive spike for channel two. Then negative spike for channel one, negative spike for channel um, two. And so that basically gives you all the information you need. The question is, can we come up with something that over here, as well as the end, can effectively differentiate those? Um, and you can see at the end, it gets maybe a little bit more tricky. Actually, does it get more tricky? It's still clean positive and clean negative. So it may be just a matter of, it may still just be a matter of a voltage peak detector and you have to set that threshold high enough. Um, not a voltage peak detector, but a comparator with the threshold set high enough. To where you won't get false 
positives. And I guess the uh, where you might get glitches is over here at the end where you've got small positive impulses. Um, and it's no longer easy for me to tell just by looking at this what's going on. I think what's happening is this was your last um, your last increment of that stepper motor and you have you know the small you know secondary response from channel one but channel two is really what is um, where the output sh is coming from so that's something to look at. A couple ideas are just basically a threshold comparator. It could do an integrator to ensure that there's, um, you know, voltage accumulated, accumulated over a certain amount of time, positive or negative voltage, and then connect that to a comparator. I don't know if that would help very much for this. I guess uh, because if we increment this one more time, let's just use the, what I want to see is what are the peak voltage outputs? If we get a cursor, okay, so this is saying 18.5 volts. but a sort of minimal yeah the minimal spike would be down here at What is this? Nine volts. So you've got to have something that is high enough to see, you know, this nine volt, or low enough to see the nine volt spike. But okay, this is just weird. I take some time to get used to these controls. I'm not used to this type of scope. So what you'd like to do is distinguish, or what I would like to do is distinguish this pulse from, so this pulse here, from over here, this pulse. And the way to do that might be overlapping or anding the output from an integrator maybe an RMS integrator, so it gets the absolute value. So you're just looking at, you know, how much, um, I'm not sure what the term is, maybe how much power is in that pulse versus the directionality of that pulse. So you want both. So that this smaller pulse, even if, uh, you know, you're going at an in-between speed that's maybe a little faster where your threshold would still pick that secondary spike up. Um, if you're doing that, then you would um, still be able to distinguish the two different types of pulses by looking at okay, is the integrated value of the absolute value of this pulse? Um, high enough to hit the threshold, and is it the right direction? So I might try and build something up like that. We'll see what uh, we'll see what happens. So now we're looking at 1K resistors at the output of each 
um, at each coil. It doesn't really look like there's any difference from that. They start disconnecting them. Like that. Okay, so it adds a little damping. I'm almost wondering if what's happening here is... Okay, I think maybe this is what's happening is... As you step forward, you can see how there's sort of a notching, but each notch is not, it doesn't go to the next notch and then stop, or the next step and stop. It bounces a little bit. Um, there's sort of a spring effect, and as it goes back and forth, that back EMF, well, it also um, rings up and down. So I wonder, I think that's probably why adding a resistor helps with that, is because it basically acts as a, a brake that's always on, you know. It's constantly absorbing energy from the stepper motor, which slows, um, which once you stop applying force, there's a lot less um, of the, the ability to spring back and forth. Okay, I wonder if I may have just found the sort of sweet spot here. 270 ohm resistors on the output of each coil or across each coil. Now we've got pretty well um, conditioned outputs. And it doesn't seem to get too crazy as you go up in speed. Yeah, the output amplitude, you know, increases a little bit once you get up there but not too much. The uh, tricky part, of course, is what do you do here? So let's just... Let's just suppose this is our amplitude. What I want to do is get... Okay, fine. So set our amplitude threshold, you know, down here, maybe right about there. It's pretty consistent. You can maybe a little bit lower, but you can generally consistently reach that amplitude with normal uh, speeds. And then if you move it up, What's the maximum amplitude we're seeing? Something like this. And when it gets all ringy, for lack of a better word, you know, does this sort of thing. It's still, uh, that secondary peak is still below the threshold that has been set. So, the question is, is this good enough? It's just a simple threshold thing. I'd like to know, okay, what exactly is going on here? Um, it looks like you've got, you know, your primary peak, so that's position one. Okay, and then the second um, channel peaks, so that's position two, and then I guess there's a sort of gap, which is interesting how one and two is right next to each other, and then three, negative channel one, and then four, negative channel two, how there's a gap between those two. I guess it just has to do with the mechanical, um, maybe not mechanical, but uh, there's there's clearly some sort of relationship between channel 1 and 2 where there's a gap between the positive and negative cycle. Okay, so something that's quite interesting 
is that when you add a potentiometer or resistor to dampen the second channel, the red here, the first channel is cleaned up quite a bit, although the second channel is dampened almost to the point of uh, you can't even see it. The first channel really um, is looking quite clean. And of course, when you take that uh, take that damping off, then now you get the ringing in the first channel. So it's interesting that I guess what I would probably say is mutual um, inductive coupling or something like that is uh, causing feedback between the two circuits uh, or between the two coils. Um, and damping that out cleans up the signal quite a bit. Okay, and now is, um, you know, higher speed. So there's that. All right, purely out of curiosity, I decided to add um, a couple of diodes in reverse configuration. These are 4007s, 1N 4007s, and just to see what would happen. And it looks like pretty interesting. If you go at a slower speed, the um, it acts very much like an encoder where, well, what you do see is the spikes are aligned vertically with it or horizontally with each other, which is interesting. That's something new. Um, and it looks a lot more like an encoder output where there's no negative spike, there's no coupling between um, coils, as far as I can tell. Now it gets a little messy up here at the higher speeds, but there's still pretty clear distinctions between positive and negative uh, cycles. Although just just because okay, as I say that I'm okay. So this is up, down, up, up down up and down down so I guess the trouble is that the secondary spike is a little harder to see uh, sorry the second yeah like one of the spikes is harder to see than the other um, it's not as high in magnitude you can see like right here that is move the cursor over there just to see that is actually a down spike from red but the magnitude isn't very high so in this case um, you would get sort of double triggers or you would miss triggering because like up here, you can see how that doesn't return to zero volts before being re-triggered. And that's not what we want. Okay, so now I have the diodes connected along with the uh, 270 ohm resistors. I think this may be a winner because as you can see okay what's going on let's just bring this level down there we go as you can see the signals or the outputs are much cleaner 
and okay so the trouble still I think is when you have these double output pulses or the uh, if you're going fast enough then these output pulses sort of start to mesh together as you can see um, this is the best way to see it although okay I have to think about this is this actually are they actually meshing together let's um, what do I want to do let's try this again because this actually looks like I think it should look where it's up, up, down, down. So maybe, what exactly is happening with these double pulses? It almost seems like, like here, for example. Let me think about this for a minute. Okay, so thinking about this a little bit, I don't think it matters whether the pulses mesh or not, um, and merge or not, and here's why. If you're just looking at state changes, um, meaning positive to negative, above a threshold or below a threshold, then that only happens, I mean, it doesn't matter if you go to zero or not in between uh, positive pulses. So like you can see here, it's pretty much positive, negative, positive, negative. It's not positive, zero, positive. Um, whereas if you move a little slower, um, it's positive, zero, positive, zero, negative, zero, negative. And for the purposes of creating an encoder, you could just have um, a latch or a flip-flop, I guess a flip-flop is what, the right word, um, where it only changes state on positive or on um, transitions from positive to negative or negative to positive. So if you have comparator 1 running when channel 1 is positive, or on when channel 1 is positive, comparator 2 when channel 1 is negative, then I think it's the D flip-flop that allows that state change to only occur when one of the comparators um, gives you a positive pulse. And if it's, you know, if the output of the comparator is zero, then there's no change in the flip-flop. Um, so with that sort of scheme, I think this would work quite well because, you know, if you're, you know, you've got space between pulses, it works. And when you don't have space between pulses, it also works. And when they're sort of meshed in between like this, where it's, makes a half transition to zero and then goes back to positive it should still work so that's what i'm going to do i'm going to build up a circuit that looks like that um work through the logic make sure that's all right and then build up a circuit with uh, different thresholds right now it looks like there's a pretty I, I guess that's the last piece is is the threshold consistent and i think the answer is it's consistent enough um, you can see uh, got about uh, 850 millivolt top and if you go slower it's about that 850 millivolt if you go as fast as you can it's uh, the diode seem to be clamping it pretty well to that 850 millivolts so that's what I'm gonna do I think uh, probably I'll play around with their threshold voltage and this oscilloscope may not be accurate um, voltage-wise, so I may have to uh, do some tinkering. 
I think, yeah, you know, this oscilloscope's pretty out of calibration. So 850 millivolts on this oscilloscope may not be actually at 850 millivolts. Okay, so here's a look at um, my scratch work or the uh, just diagram of what the circuit should look like. Um, the What I've done is, okay, so up here basically what you have is this is your input signal, one, uh, just one coil, not both coils. Um, so you have, you know, positive, positive. Okay, actually this is both coils, but just looking at one coil, this is positive, um, zero positive, zero negative, zero negative. So what we're looking for is only on these state changes from positive to negative, do we want to change? And then coil two we'll worry about later. Basically, whatever the circuit is for coil one will be a duplicate uh, for the coil two circuit. So if we set this to you know half of your supply voltage or somewhere in between, it doesn't even have to be half. I'm saying let's set it to 3.3 volts. So you can just use a linear regulator for that, and then a five volt regulator for the logic uh, power. You have your coil here, and then you have two comparators. One has a threshold voltage of 2.8 volts, which is 500 millivolts over under the 3.3 volts. And um, this uh, basically goes positive when the input voltage is below. The 3.8 volt comparator is 500 millivolts above this 3.3 volts and it goes positive when you're above that 3.8 volt threshold voltage so one comparator basically uh, this comparator basically goes positive when you see or has an output of one a high output when you have a positive pulse and this negative comparator goes high when you have a negative pulse. And so what you do that is feed that into the SR latch. I know I said it was a D flip-flop, I think, before. Uh, my digital logic is rusty, so I got that wrong. It's actually an SR latch that you want. And what you have is uh, the SR latch, just to look, show you. This is the truth table for the SR latch. Basically what it says is when both inputs are zero, it doesn't do anything, it just holds its state. When the reset state is one, um, the output goes to one. When the um, set state is one, the output goes to zero. And when they're both one, the output is zero. And this should never happen at the same time to where they're both one, so we shouldn't have to worry about that. It's basically these three states where it changes output based on that. And um, I think the way you have these configured to the inputs depends on the chip. Are you connected to the Q or Q naught? Do you want a positive, um, positive output to be associated with the positive here? Or uh, do you want it to be inverted? And so we'll worry about that once we find the chips we will use, uh, because that's kind of an implementation specific thing. These are the parts I decided to use for uh, building this up. I didn't, I don't have any SR latches on hand, but I do have a 7A4HCO2, which is a four gate NOR, um, NOR gate, I guess, chip. And then I have a TLC3702, which is just a two input comparator. So this should be what I need. One um, other thing is, you know, to get the voltages, threshold voltages. These are the resistor dividers I'm using, um, probably for a bench test. I could just use potentiometers, but uh, if I could find the resistors, they'll be easier. Um, The other thing is, for this 3.3 volt input, I could either use a regulator or just another voltage divider. It's probably 
at this point. If I can find a regulator, I'll just use a regulator. But I don't think you need one because there's no real current being um, pushed across that line. That's just to set the reference voltage of the uh, stepper motor. So I don't believe that it's necessary to use a regulator or anything that can carry any sort of current or provide any sort of current. That said, I think, uh, I think all that's left is to breadboard this up and see how it works. Okay, so it's all wired up and um, let's look at the results. It looks like if you turn the stepper motor slowly, if this would actually just trigger once, Let's turn this off. Okay, so it does what I want it to do. Um, the yellow is the output of the SR latch. The red is the input to the stepper motor. Of course, it's offset this time by 3.3 volts. And uh, yeah, there's two negative edges. And then on the first positive edge, it's which is states. Two positive edge, negative edge, switch of states. And, of course, if you want to, you know, make the positive edge of the SR output correlate to the positive transition of the stepper motor, you would just, uh, you know, either switch the output of the SR latch or from Q to Q0 or rearrange the inputs to the, um, the comparators. So at any of those stages you can change it, but uh, it seems to work pretty well. You go fast and you got that nice uh, fast response. Um, let's just see how quickly we can change this. Yeah, so I mean it looks pretty good. Like this is good enough for even if there's a glitch once in a while, which there doesn't seem to be glitches very often, or I haven't seen any glitches at all yet. So this seems to be more than good enough for general use. And if you go really slow, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's change the time base around. One. I mean, it doesn't matter how uh, fast you go or how slowly you go, which is was my big concern with this, is that you would not be able to pick up those small impulses. Right now I'm changing this about every half second. And look at that, right on, right on the edges. So this, I'm going to go ahead and use this for one of my projects. And uh, that'll be kind of cool to see, you know, stepper motor being used as a knob. The one downside about this is with its 270 ohm resistors and the uh, two opposite diodes, this is kind of stiff, which maybe in some applications you like that. It's not going to work very well in applications where you don't want that stiffness. So there's that of uh, the... You know, what's left to implement the rest of this is you have to do the second half. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. Uh, or I, I decided to go ahead and test the second channel or coil on the stepper motor. And the reason is I just want to see how the phases um, of the two coils are offset and see if it looks like it's doing a good job keeping the spacing even. Although... For a user input application, not really a big deal. Um, you don't care so much about getting, you know, millisecond precise input of your um, sensor or your device. So let's go ahead and see what we get here. Let's 
just okay uh the volts per division are off okay So if you ask me, that's pretty good phase offset. That's, um, you know, pretty much right in the middle. The uh, edges, the edge of one coil is right about in the middle of the next coil's state. So, yeah. Um, I think we got a winner here. Now, the other question is, does this work with other stepper motor types? I'm just focusing on bipolar stepper motor, and this one in particular. Um, I don't know what model it is. I guess it's... Uh, there we go. Tamagawa, some just Japanese brand. And... 12 volt, I think it's 40 ohms per coil, resistance, and um, it's a fairly large stepper motor, not the smaller, more common type. I don't know what the NEMA standard is. It's like NEMA 20 or something. Okay, so I have two NEMA 17 motors, I think. I think they're NEMA 17s right here. This one came out of the same uh, device as the other motor. So it's the Japanese Tamagawa. I don't know if you can even find this one if you looked it up. This other one, I think this is just a cheap Chinese motor. And uh, it's a little bigger, a little taller. So we're going to go ahead and see if they work. I'm not even sure this is bipolar because it's got, what, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, pins. Two of them might be dead, or two of them might be connected to nothing, and that would make it, I think, bipolar. Otherwise, it's a different type, um, like unipolar or something. Okay, so believe it or not, with no modifications to the circuit, you know, the resistor um, right here that's, uh, I guess, damping the output, this works just fine and you can see that's the output there uh, if we want to look at the input okay i'm not sure if the input and output are exactly uh the right channel it might be phase one connected to coil two or sorry output two connected to coil one or something like that but this if the scope will show us this shows the um, behavior of what's going on. And surprisingly, this, I mean, it just tracks these edges like, okay, maybe not perfectly. So if you're going too slow, yeah, if you're going too slow on this stepper motor, it's not going to capture those edges. But if you're going just a little bit faster than, you know, zero speed, then it captures the edges pretty well. So that's pretty uh, good to know um, that this works. And when I said I would be using this um, in a project, it's going to be a soldering iron controller and rather than an encoder mechanical or optical encoder knob. We just have a stepper motor knob on there and uh, we'll see how that feels. I think it'll feel pretty good because I kind of like the way, I mean, it'll probably feel higher quality than, you know, your cheap $2 mechanical encoder knob. So that's it for this. Um, I'll see you later.